here. Okay, so so I'd ask you for this exercise to uh, to extend a model which we had partly previously built together before, and partly you had built it on your own. Um, and uh, that model involved an SEIR model, uh, but where there was waning of immunity, so SEIRS. And uh, successively, we'd elaborated it with, uh, with that waning and with uh, rep representation of hospitalization and, and deaths with me doing some of those to, to simplify your tasks. Um, now, what I had asked you to do for this, uh, this take home exercise was to extend it yet further with the representation of vaccination. Um, and uh, the way in which uh, I requested you to perform the vaccination has some trade-offs. We alluded to some of them in the closing, well, in, in part of last session together, and we'll, we'll come back to that issue. But essentially, the model modifications, which I asked you to undertake, took the susceptible stock, the susceptible state variable here, our compartment, and connected it up to a, to a vaccination uh, compartment or state variable or, or stock. Um, and the idea here was that vaccination would remove people from susceptibility and move them instead to this vaccinated area. Um, by so doing, um, we take them out of risk of infection. Infection here still occurs in the modified model uh, in a way that only puts at risk those who are susceptible um, and, and infects those people and making them exposed. If someone's vaccinated, they're removed from that, the possibility of taking that flow. That flow can only be taken from the susceptible stock. Um, as long as they're in this vaccinated stock, uh, they're represented as being immune to infection. And that will lead to a lower fraction of the population remaining susceptible. We had previously seen that of all the things applying within communicable disease models, the fraction that remains susceptible is, is arguably and probably likely the single biggest factor for explaining the dynamics of those models um, in its essence. It's the fraction that are susceptible determines how efficiently infectious individuals, infective individuals, to use different terminology, um, can spread the infection. Um, why is that? Why is it that the fraction that are susceptible makes such an overwhelming impact on on the efficiency with which infection can spread. Can anyone um, uh, share a, a comment on that? Um, ideally verbally, otherwise um, in the, the chat. Anyone, why is that? Why, why is it that the fraction that are susceptible has such a disproportionate impact and how, through what, why is it that it has this impact on the spread of infection, anyone? Um, hello? Yes, please. Um, it is because if there's less susceptibles in the population, there's less people to get infected. That's right. So there are fewer people to get infected. And each uh, infection, each, each infective or infectious individuals is surrounded by more and more people that can't infect. Um, the number of people they can infect is, is smaller and smaller of the people around them. So over the course of their illness or per unit time per day, say, um, they're, they're at risk of infecting fewer people. Um, if only maybe normally they infect four people on average over the course of their illness, but if half the people around them are only half are susceptible, they can only infect two people on average uh, before they recover. And that makes all the difference because we saw that an infection stops going up and starts and plateaus, and then will start to come down under what condition? When that infective infects how many people before they recover? When they infect how many? It will plateau and not go up any further. It'll just, the number of people infected will stay constant 
um, and and will subsequently decline when when they can affect how many people before they recover on average. Constant when it's one, and then it decreases yeah. when it's less than one. Exactly, it starts going down when it's less than one. Excellent, and I see many uh, put their names forward, so I'd like to to thank uh, Kenneth and and Chuck and, and Gregory and Zainab and Rico and by uh, by voice, I, I, I suspect it was Larissa um, who spoke up there. And that's exactly right, that's exactly right. So um, if they just replace themselves with a single infected before they recover, they infect one person before they recover, then the number of infectives is not going up, it's not going down, it's staying constant. Um, and if it's less than one, then it will start to go down. And that's the nature of infections. They're self-limiting here. They uh, undercut the fuel they need to, con to continue to sustain themselves. They burn through that fuel, they can't sustain themselves effectively, and they die down. Um, and that fuel, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing other but susceptibles. And it's the fraction that are susceptible that's that key throttle that limits the ability to spread. And so vaccination reduces that fraction that remains susceptible. It takes people away from possible susceptibility. Um, and if it disproportionately, you know, if, if, it, if you're shifting people from susceptibility to vaccination, you've enormously reduced the fraction of people around infectious people that they can infect, those infected people can infect. Um, so if you infect half the population, you reduce that ability of infected people to infect by factor two. Um, if you shift uh, you know, three quarters of the population away, you've reduced it by factor four. Um, so this is the, the, the key limiting factor. So I asked you to, to represent the vaccine in stock and, and we have, um, uh, two ways in which we were reasoning about those people infected. One is people start here, and I asked you to have a initial, uh, excuse me, there's already an initial population size, but there's an initial fraction vaccinated um, here, which, which dictates the degree to which people start here or, 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 or start here, particularly here and exposed. Um, uh, so that's a, a key way in which people get here. But uh, I allowed for another way, which was associated with this flow here, by which people get vaccinated over time. And there's a bit of a, a race between vaccination processes and infection spread processes. Um, and if we could just get people vaccinated quick enough, we might be able to head off a big outbreak. And, and that's indeed what happened in the spring, um, uh, starting a little bit less than a year ago, excuse me, a little bit more than a year ago, nursing homes, uh, indigenous, uh, indigenous reserves reflective of the, the very high rates of crowding um, that are on, on reserves and, and uh, the, the lack of, um, Local um, local medical support beyond a at most a nurse station and and so on. Um, uh, individuals in those groups, healthcare workers, rolled out vaccine, and then successively lower age groups um, were rolled out, and we were racing the new variants that were appearing: alpha, beta, gamma, alpha from. Uh, probably originally from, uh, uh, gosh, I should know this. Uh, Alpha was from UK, it really achieved prominence. Beta from South Africa was first discovered. Um, uh, gamma from Brazil it was first discovered, um, caused big problems there. Um, and then of course, Delta um, coming in in late spring and, and early, uh, early summer uh, in its first hints, but, um, uh, but presaging a, a grim fall. Um, we were racing those by getting people vaccinated. And so we had people kind of transferring to this vaccination stock. But we also represented the fact that vaccination is 
is rarely permanent. There are some infections where it is more or less, it, it confers more or less permanent immunity. Uh, again, measles, I'd cite. Thank goodness, because measles is one of the most communicable diseases around, communicable illnesses around, pathogens around. Um, and um, fortunately, vaccination is more or, less, more or less lifelong. So is natural immunity to it. By contrast, um, with something like uh, influenza, prudent individuals get their flu shot every year, lower the risk of infection, lower the risk of adverse outcomes if they get infected because there's waning going on and it reflects mutation of the, of the virus. And the fact that several strains are, 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 are circulating in a given year and you might, or several lineages and you might get infected by, by a strain for which, or lineage for which you are not vaccinated. So we have waning going on. That can reflect the fact that your immune complement, your set of cells that protect you against these processes. Immune system is just a wonderfully rich and sophisticated thing. And people, as I noted last time, build models of the dynamics of immune system using compartments a lot like these a lot of the time. And um, we have all sorts of wonderful defenders in there, uh, antibodies, um, but, um, but also T cells, uh, natural killer cells, and and uh, neutrophils and macrophages. And um, as there's a, a whole host of, of defenses our bodies have, very sophisticated. And yet they're always trading off how many defenses to keep against each pathogen based on what they see. And if they see a lot of TB, they're gonna be developing defense against TB. If they see a lot of COVID, they're gonna be developing defenses against that. If they see a lot of uh, chicken pox or see a lot of pertussis or see a lot of measles, they're going to be developing defenses against them. And so we got to deal with if we know, well, COVID's not around a lot, but it could sweep back here in big spades. We got to keep their immune system prime with vaccinations. Um, so there's waning of vaccines um, that is represented here, just like there's waning of immunity here. For a lot of diseases, vaccination confers um, less long immunity than natural infection. Natural infection gets your immune system uh, really a big punch that it remembers and it's a lesson learned. Um, but for some, and COVID is included, vaccination delivers considerably longer immunity than natural immunity, than getting infected. Um, and, uh, and so it is, as I said, with COVID. And, and um, we might have different rates. Here I asked you to just use the same rate, um, this uh, waning of, of vaccination. Um, so that was the, the overall plan of what I asked you to, uh, to expand. Now, before we talk about the dynamics of the model, uh, we can talk about how this was set up. So some of, these, some of the basic situation was simple to examine, like this initial fraction uh, vaccinated um, excuse me, this, this flow, I said to set it to zero. What, what's the formula, ladies and gentlemen, for associated with this waning? I'll give you a hint. This is a first order delay. This is an outflow from a first order delay. Uh, so, and we have a rate here, a chance per unit time, say chance per day, as it is here, um, of having our immunity wane and landing us back in the susceptible side state. Um, what's the formula for this going to be in terms of this rate and in terms of susceptible? Can anyone say this can be a formula that involves this and a formula that, and, and, and this thing as well? And what's, what's that formula going to be? Can anyone speak up? Anyone? Is it nine bar divided by the, um, the rate of waning of immunity per day? Okay, you, you're in the right area generally. But this is a, there's actually an issue here that I want to head off for you at the final exam. Um, and, and by you, I'm using the, the royal you, all of you. Okay. Um, um, and um, 
uh, and and here uh, it's it's not divided by. Um, this is a unit one over day. It's a probability per day. It's like, and with probabilities, it's like number of coin flips were turned up heads over total number of coin flips. It's dimensionless. Whether we measure measure coin flips in thousands of coin flips or one per coin flip, it's dimensionless. The coins and the numerator and denominator cancel. So it's the unit associated with this probability per day is one over day. Um, the unit associated with vaccination is people. What's when you have a flow into or out of a stock that has dimension people, what's the dimension of the stock? Hmm? The dimension of the stock is, come on, I mean, the stock's accumulating this uh, over time. Um, if, if this, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some mnemonics way to put it all together. I mean, if you have a rate of flow in um, of 10, you have no outflow. Let's consider one of these guys. Imagine this is 10, 10, the, the value of this, I'm not saying that, the unit because we'll give it away. Suppose this is 10 um, and the stock starts empty. After five time steps, time units, what's the value of the stock going to be? If you have 10 coming in, what's the value of the stock going to be after five time units? It's just constant inflow. What's the value of the stock going to be? 50. 50. 50, it just accumulates. The first time unit accumulates 10. That's what 10 means. Second, it accumulates 10. Third, it accumulates 10. I think you know where this is going. Over the course of those five time units, say days, it's accumulating 10 for each of them. That's what this flow means. Flowing on 10 per unit time. So if this is measured in, if this were measured in people, a flow is measured in people per unit time. Um, this is this is hospitalizations is the unit of this. This is hospitalizations per unit time. If this is total infections, you know, counts infections that occur, this will be infections per unit time. If this is people, this will be people per unit time. This will be people per unit time. Whatever the the, the unit is associated with dimension or, or I mean associated with the stock or I'm being fast and loose in my terminology I'm talking dimensions here units are like centimeters uh, to measure length versus meters to measure length both are lengths they both have dimension length um this is people this is people per unit time say people per day this is people per unit time this is people per unit time Okay, so all that is saying, the formula for this has to be, um, the person who spoke up bravely, which I'm so appreciative, very got the essential thing right. The formula for this is some constant times vaccinated, but it's not vaccinated divided by this, it's vaccinated, this is a multiple. multiplied by it, this is a, something, you know, probably per day. It's a one over day is the unit times people is people per day. Um, that's the way units combine. Um, uh, and there's beautiful math behind that that um, I wish we had time to discuss, but alas, uh, time is short. And the question in this course is the 95% I leave out. Um, so the formula for this is this, time set please please promise me on the exam you'll remember that um this is a rate the formula is the rate times this and it has to be because a rate is unit one over time or, or dimension one over time um and so you multiply it by this and you get whatever the unit the dimension of the stock is say people per unit time um if this were a time like a mean time until you get until you lose immunity, this would be vaccinated divided by that time. And it would 
the dimensions people per unit time. Um, oh, if this is a mean time, that's got to be divided by. If this is a rate, its unit is one over, or its dimension is one over time, you're going to multiply it by, okay? Um, but I so admire the gentleman for speaking up because he, he helped the class learn that principle. And if all of you apply that principle, you'll be better off in the final exam. And I'll have less risk of crying when marking it. Um, okay, so, um, and you'll have less risk of crying while, while doing it, um, which is also good, very good in my book. Um, okay, so um, moving on, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was the extension I asked you to undergo. We had this formula for that. Um, and I asked you to make sure uh, that a couple things were done. So one thing is the fraction of people that, that are in various places. I, I gave you a fraction, initial fraction vaccinated. And there's an initial population size. So the formula for this is what? If we have an initial fraction vaccinated, the initial fraction of the entire population that's vaccinated, we have a total population. What's the formula for this? For It's an initial value. Remember, each stock, we have to specify initial value. What's the initial value of this? Speak fraction over. vaccinated times susceptible. Yes, yes, you hit it exactly right. Fraction vaccinated times susceptible. Good. Excellent. Um, that's, that's, that's terrific. Now, I said, but we want the total number of people in the whole population to add up to, to, the, to the initial population size at the start. So we know to simplify the situation, we had pre-specified this, 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 and this all start empty. One person starts exposed. Um, if you look, that's what I had asked you to specify way back when, and that's the case. Okay, great. So then the question is, what is the, what is the formula for this? Does anyone want to say? What's the formula for this such that if we add this, the initial value here, the initial, sorry, I'm saying what's the formula for the initial value of this stock? Stocks, their evolution is dictated by the flows. We only have to specify their initial value. After that, it's the flows in and flows out that determine how the stock changes because the flows reflect how quickly it changes uh, up or down. The net flow, if the net flow is zero, the stock will stay constant. If the net flow is positive, meaning more is coming in than is going out, the stock will rise. If the net flow is negative, meaning more is going out than is coming in, the stock will fall. Um, so when, with stocks, we just specify the initial value. Boom. We specify that, and after that, its evolution is determined by the flows. So the initial value of this is, uh, Larissa said it, almost in a stentorian voice, initial uh, fraction vaccinated times uh, initial population size. We have one person starting here. Everything else is zero. And we want to set the susceptible so that the sum of all the stocks, which is really the sum of this one and this one and this one, because these are all start zero, some of all their initial values is initial population size. So what is the formula for the number of people that start in this stock susceptible? Anyone? Multiple people put it in the uh, chat. It's initial minus uh, exposed minus vaccinated. Um, just out of curiosity slash uh, software engineering, when you guys, when you initially gave us this version six, uh, you have the initial population minus one rather than minus exposed. Wouldn't minus exposed be better? Uh, this is a great question. And I was thinking about that issue, musing on it as the minutes tick down to course, uh, to, the, to the class. Um, so uh, in some software packages, you can say that, and in some, you can't. Um, and um, uh, you're absolutely right that it would be more robust to change this. So I'll tell you what I put there. And I stand before Larissa with a sense of rightful shame in chastening um, because I 
I set this formula in a way that is most unsalubrious. Um, so we have exposed being one, and I set this formula to one minus the initial fraction vaccinated. That's the rest of the people who are an start vaccinated times initial population size, and then minus one. And for those who want to do the math, you can see one minus this times this will be 1.0 times initial population size. So it's the initial population size minus this times the initial population size. That's the people who start in the vaccinated state minus one. And this troubled me greatly, almost to the point where, well, it comes close to keeping me from losing sleep, uh, keeping me, you know, keeping me up at night, keeping me from sleeping. Um, when I see this, my my very fibers uh, um, uh, sort of uh, impel me against it because this is fragile. Why is it fragile? Why is this risky for me to hard code this 1.0? Um, could anyone say, why is that risky? Because if you change the number of exposed initial, um, you're yeah. going to forget about changing this. I'm going to forget about that. And and there's nothing that indicates here that this, this 1.0 is the same as that one. So if someone were to search in the model when changing this one for 1.0, they might find a whole bunch of references to 1.0 in different places and they can't tell like which of them are logically linked. This one is, oh my gosh, um, uh, somehow I abused that, but um, they can't tell like this one is logically the same as that one. And so they forget to update it or they don't update it. And that's how bugs creep in. Magic numbers are big way back bugs creep in. And it gets especially deleterious if I had put, you know, um, uh, if if I, I put some formula involving this and and just did that formula ahead of time, you wouldn't know that that's one point in this formula from this. And so yes, it's I was a bad boy, but I was a bad boy for a reason because I used so many of these modeling software. I couldn't actually remember off the top of my head if any logic allows you to just say minus exposed. Um, and uh, I'll say it. I changed mine to minus exposed and then just sent them a link. Um, yeah, so that would be much better. It would be less robust and it would allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to, to get a proper good night of sleep. Um, so I'm going to put that there and it's all happy and it shows this as a dotted line to indicate it uses it only in the initial value and things are good and the birds chirp in the trees and the sun is shining and the number of cases and number of new infections in Saskatoon is dropping. Um, so uh, here, that is a much more robust solution. So uh, I stand chastened. Um, and in fact, to, to, to complete the thought, this should be what? To be a bit more robust. Where'd this 1.0 come from? I mean, it, it makes sense, but, but we could clear it up just by saying um, it, it would be better if I, Change this formula to be something that was posted in the chat, which is initial population minus what? Minus what's the other thing besides exposed? vaccinated? Vaccinated, yes, vaccinated. And we need a little link to keep it from you know uh, being unhappy. Um, basically, it needs a link to say, hey, you know, I want to show the dependencies here. So this depends on those two states. Now you could argue, should I really have the other states, which happen to start zero. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's uh, a fair thing to say. But, um, you know, it's still still showing me, um, um, it's still showing me, oh, yes, because now it no longer depends on this. And this just, uh, just informs this, and I no longer have to derive this formula with one minus it, et cetera. So, that last change was a little bit of aesthetics, uh, but this is clear. It's like, this is everyone except, everyone in the population except those who started vaccinated or exposed. That is intention revealing and it's less fragile. And if you don't believe me, go work as a software engineer for five years and you'll find those magic numbers come back and kill you. Um, uh, uh, you know, hopefully not literally, but, uh, they, 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 
they cause problems. They cause bugs. They keep you up late at night. Um, and, you know, by just lowering these unnecessary vulnerabilities, we can go further in our software engineering, spend less time tracing down bugs and more time delivering value um, to, to customers. So, so Larissa is exactly right. Models, ladies and gentlemen, are software artifacts. Um, and I'm actually one of the few voices in the world really noting um, firmly this, uh, this fact, believe it or not. And uh, you will see it in bigger spades with more sophisticated models yet, like with agent-based models, where there's actually a fair bit of software engineering that goes behind them. But you will find most practitioners of those models unaware of the principles of software engineering and getting in all sorts of deep doo-doo because of it. Um, deep, deep, well, I could use other words, but I won't. Um, deep problems because they don't treat it, they don't dignify it with the rules of software engineering. Software engineering matters, ladies and gentlemen. It's about avoiding risks, heading them off proactively, managing them, and uh, in modeling, we're building software artifacts and it befits us to use principles of software engineering. Um, okay, so uh, enough said um, about the structure here. Um, and uh, that was a great point for um, Larissa to make. Uh, I hadn't planned to, to cover that, but it had stuck in my craw as I was preparing this meeting um, so much that, that I was using that 1.0, it troubled me. Uh, Hmm. So forgive me for eating my lunch um, in front of you, but um, perhaps it was because it was stuck in my craw before I wasn't able to properly eat it. Um, okay, so we made that change. How does this affect the dynamic? Oh, there is one other thing we did. Um, and that is we put in a, well, we put in a link. What was the link for? I asked you to put in a link from vaccinated to another variable in the model that could easily be overlooked. What is that variable? Anyone? Current population. Current population size. Um, this is actually a big vulnerability. And uh, I have to confess to you, I have a bit of a confession to make. Um, um, normally I always build my exercises for you. I, I do them ahead of time to just debug them. This one was so easy for me to put together. I just kind of uh, 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 got it out there and, and I could just do it in my head and what the steps are, boom, sent it to you. Um, and then I went to do it about 10 minutes before class um, and um, 10 or 15 minutes and, um, and went through it, <coughs> excuse me. And I forgot to modify this. And <coughs> I noted dynamics that I knew that would, that's, not possible. And um, and then of course I realized, oh, I forgot to have current population size dependent on it. This is a, a failure of today's software engineering environments for modeling. They don't allow you to express current population size is uh is meant to be, its intention is to be a sum of uh, variables of that to know you know people. Um, it doesn't allow you to say that. So you add that, and you have to manually remember to add it in here. So I added in the vaccinated stock. Um, th this has a certain semantics to it, unfortunately, which packages don't capture and they can't alert you to this. You have to remember, oh, I added a stock. This needs to be modified as a result. There's an implicit dependency of this on what stocks you have that are lost. <clears throat> So um, important lesson and avenue for improving projects. We have work underway, with, which allows you to encode that. Anyway, um, these model changes um, induce dynamics. Um, we, they change the dynamics of things. Now, because initially by default, uh, people's, by default, the default assumption for the baseline case is that nobody starts vaccinated. So they shouldn't change the baseline results for Omicron or wild type. But if we start to have 50% vaccination, what is the effect? Can anyone say you ran some scenarios? What's the effect of that on the dynamics of infection? What's the effect of that on say the um, maximum number of cases that come <clears throat> or the uh, 
number of people that get infected over time. Anyone? Um, with increased vaccination rates, it reduced the cumulative amount of infections and hospitalizations. Uh, along with the peak hospitalization uh, value for both the wild type and the Omicron. Good, good. Um, is, there a, is there a point at which, <clears throat> for all intents and purposes, infection no longer spreads? In other words, you have enough vaccination that infection doesn't materially spread. Maybe one person who started exposed becomes eventually infectious. That's the nature of it. They're gonna become infectious or get hospitalized. They're gonna be non-infectious, non-hospitalized non infectious or hospitalized. Um, so definitely we're gonna have one person who eventually becomes infectious, whether hospitalized or not. But is there a situation which no outbreak really of, of substance really happens? Uh, yes. For the wild type, it was after 80% or greater. Uh, mm. For the Omicron variant, it was at, um, there was no percentage that could stop it dead. Okay. So um, let's go through this. So that's great. Let's remember. Um, so I'm, I'm so grateful. Who was that speaking up? Uh, it was Kenneth. Okay, okay, Kenneth, you're bang on. Um, I don't think I could have put it better myself. And um, uh, and this is good. Um, um, oh, um, uh, okay. So earlier there was a problem with my video. Can you see me now? Yeah, we can see you. I think it was more the specific person. Zoom wasn't working. Oh, okay. 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 Well, uh, I don't know yeah, what they're saying. Mine is still not. You're still not seeing me? You're still not seeing me? No, but I restarted it. And so I think it's just. Uh, the program that I'm using. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, regrets uh, for that. Uh, uh, hopefully, I won't. Uh, I won't. You know, require um, that sort of uh, appearance of me. Um, um, okay. So, um, if just to remember the baseline, uh, the baseline dynamics here, uh, we're going to run wild type with zero vaccination. Nobody starts vaccinated. And what we get for baseline for wild type, um, that's this one here, by running it like that, we're going to get um, you know maximum number who get infected at one time going up to uh, about 275,000 and, and hospitalized that would have resulted about 4,000, a little bit more than 4,000. You know, over the course of the simulation, you have over 1.1 1, 1 million. Uh, people uh, infections that have occurred, whether it's the same person multiple times or to one person, and cumulative hospitalizations over that time, which are substantive. Um, and there are also, you know, deaths there, um, about 28, 2,900. Um, now, with uh, vaccination in place, 50% initially being vaccinated, the infection is hampered in spreading because we've got people here. You'll notice it's changing. Why is this dropping? Can anyone say? It's dropping because of what? Remember, stocks only change because of their flows. Um, inflow minus outflow and dictates the rate of change. So why is this changing? Anyone? Uh, there's uh, no inflow of more vaccinated people. OK, good. And there is a what? There's an outflow. There's an outflow, and so it's it's people are waning in, in vaccination, and you'll notice that what results is a smaller peak number of infections, um, a smaller number of hospitalizations to be sure, substantively smaller, even at fifty percent, right? A lot, a lot lower deaths, um, and um, and you know fewer cumulative infections. Uh, again, less than a half half that rate um, and fewer cumulative hospitalizations. Okay, now at 80%, what, what do we see? What did you folks see? And then I'll, I'll show you what my model produces, hey? Kenneth kind of said it earlier with, with a clarity worthy of him. What, what is it? Worthy of anyone. What do you see at 80%, anyone? 
Well, this is what you should, should see roughly. Um, the, in, the infection, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, um, there, there's a definitely non-obvious curve here. But if you look at the peak number of people infected, it's like 1.2 people. You know, it's, it's not spreading widely. Um, um, you know, I couldn't interpret what's going on here. This is showing the fraction that are infectious. That depends on, well, this one person who starts here and, um, you know, so, some of that person goes into the hospitalized state, some goes to infectious. And, um, but eventually, as the sun follows the, the night um, and in the fullness of time, people recover and they go back to a susceptible state. And guess what's happening over time? Back at the farm, guess what's happening? That sets the stage. Vaccinated or losing immunity. Yeah, losing protection. And so you have a greater fraction of people eventually ending up susceptible than started originally. Um, and you actually are setting the stage for a, a larger subsequent kind of rise because over the course of this year, you have you know, a decent number of people have lost immunity. Um, and so at this time, you know, you have 617,000, which is a lot more than started there originally. Um, and if, if we look at 95%, what do we see there? Anyone? Well, it, it, it never gets off the ground in any material way. And cumulative infections, 0.288. It's like, you know, less than one person on average uh, infected. Um, basically the infection peters out. It's, it's just not a significant thing, but even at 80%, I mean, for all intents and purposes at 80%, it's um, not materially spreading. It's like 7.6 people infected, you know, 0.25 people, 0.125 people um, hospitalized over the course. So essentially we've stopped it at 80%. How about for Omicron, anyone? Omicron remembers a lot more infectious. It actually lasts for less long, but it it has a uh, much greater infectiousness. I, I, I said it so that it's uh, a basic reproductive number would be, well, um, we have a mean contacts per person per day, that's C, times beta, that mean probability of transmission or the probability of transmission per discordant contact 0.15, times the time in, they, they are infectious. Remember, beta C, beta D. Uh, C beta is the number of people the infectious pe person could infect per unit time if they were surrounded by all susceptibles. Um, and then we multiply by the number of days that they're circulating in said susceptibles, 10, and we get 15. Um, okay, um, great. Uh, so, well, it's not so great. Uh, but if we have 50% Omicron, let's go take a look. Um, and we will run this out and 50% infection. We do not see it dying out to be sure. Um, I should have run the baseline, excuse me. We always want to compare with some referent, some, some referent that, that's clear. And here it's a case without vaccination. Okay, Omicron would have a really sharp sharp peak that, that approaches 700,000 and goes to nearly 12,000 hospitalizations at a given time during its peak. Cumulative hospitalizations, 24,000 and 1.6 million cumulative infections, okay? And now if we have 50% vaccination, um, does it stamp it out? Does it die out? You folks tell me, does it die out or not with Omicron with 50% vaccination? Uh, it does not die out. Does not die out is right. Um, um, okay, so it's 300,000 max uh, people infected at a given time, still somewhat peaked. Um, uh, fewer than 5,500 uh, hospitalizations, cumulative infections, just over a million. It's non-trivial, 15,000 hospitalizations, but we've reduced it a lot. Notice that there is this subsequent, um, subsequent, sort of rise, what, what does that do to? Why are we seeing this rise? Where, 
what what could drive that sort of rise? Why is it that a rise could come later like that? That we could waning actually of immunity. Yeah, it's waning of immunity. This fuel to the fire being added. A lot of these folks. And where are they waning from? Whence are they waning? They're waning from two places. Where what is it? People come into susceptible from waning immunity in two places. What is vaccinated it? Vaccinated and recovered. Yeah, vaccinated and recovered are both waning. Indeed. Um uh so um those those individuals who have uh who have waned um end up in susceptible and they can fuel that outbreak. Um, and you notice there's kind of a little bit of a subsequent outbreak. Um, I suspect these will soon be a reality. Um, there's a case to be made that the um, Delta outbreak, uh, particularly uh, the, the, the outbreak of Delta that occurred before Omicron really rushed in and became dominant over the holidays, a lot of that was due to waned immunity from people who got vaccinated, guess what, early and didn't get boosted. Um, so particularly those most vulnerable vaccinated in um, long-term care homes, um, uh, for example, if they didn't get boosted, most did, but if they didn't get boosted, they were kind of due for a waning of immunity. Those who were not in care homes, but at, at home, um, you know, but it got vaccinated earlier in time, like February or March, they quite a few of them became susceptible again and if they didn't get boosted they they got hit in that in that christmas outbreak where people gave them the gift that kept on giving um so so that's actually a reality and we're going to see it probably seasonally going forward um for those who don't get boosted okay so um so, so this is uh interesting um that is 50 percent. okay you essentially eliminated it with wild type with 80 percent let's let's do that for omicron here we go what do we see at 80 percent for omicron does it bring omicron to its knees proverbially anyone uh it makes a pretty good dent in it but doesn't really stop it yeah it makes a good dent it brings down the number of infection not from 700,000, but to less than 120,000. Brings back the number of hospitalized people at a given time to like um, uh, 2,100. Um, you notice there are these peaks in hospitalization that, that result later. Um, cumulative hospitalizations to 10,000 instead of 24,000 and cumulative infections to less than 700,000 rather than 1.6 million. Um, so it, it does, make a, does make quite a difference, but it doesn't come close. 80% vaccination does not come close to, to bringing it to heal, to, to preventing it from, um, from, from being able to establish itself and have cause a big outbreak. It causes a big outbreak, despite 80% vaccination, which um, is not too far off from what the province is at right now. Um, you can see why Omicron was such a game changer and why the day it was diagnosed, I was texting the dearest friends and, and family saying, you know, go get N95 masks, try to get your boosters as soon as possible, et cetera. When it was announced as identified in Africa and we saw the basic essentials in late November. Um, and um, I actually should, I, I think I was negligent and I didn't do the, the uh, 95%. Here, we'll do it here and we'll do 95% and uh, there we go, 0.95. Um, happy, happy. Okay. There is also a delay in the peak. Um, yes. Roughly 50-ish days, I think. Good, good, good. For 80%, there was still a delay. Yeah. So this is a very salient point. Thank you. So, um, Vaccination slows the ability to spread. And the peak here, so Larissa, you mentioned a key thing because delays buy time for the healthcare system to respond. It buys time for them to get ready the surge capacity to train the nurses, which is what they were doing based on our model results while the ministry played fiddle and, and twiddled their thumb. Actually, it was not the, I, I'm not gonna blame the minister. It's the political side of the operation. Um, uh, the folks, the health folks in the ministry are, are wonderful um, in their commitments and their concerns. Um, the issue is above them. Um, 
And, um, and so here we had this occurring roughly time, maybe 30, the, the timing of that peak. And I should have looked for completeness at hospitalization. But if we even go to 50%, um, you'll notice that it materially changes uh, the, the timing of that. Hospitalization timing changes, but this changes to maybe 45. And hospitalization is pretty close timing there. Uh, if we go to 80% for Omicron, we bought ourselves more time because we can, um, you know, it'll spread less quickly through the population. Um, it'll take longer for that infective to find that extra person to infect. And so here, you know, it's occurring at maybe time 70 to 80 or something like that. Um, and then 95% for Omicron, um, what are we seeing? Well, um, we're seeing uh, not quite extinction, but we're seeing marked reductions, cumulative infections further being reduced uh, here. And we're seeing um, a situation where we have the count hospitalized going to, to just 1,500. I will do a one final one here, uh, which is uh, I'm going to do um, 0.99. Um, so 99%, um, say 98%, 98% Omicron here. Um, and we will do this with um, 98% there. And I'm going to copy it and or excuse me, run it. Go. Um, why not click that? Come on. Come on. Okay. Um, great. There it goes, uh, boom. Um, and uh, still is still is causing some challenges. You notice it's much, much delayed. Let's do, well, I could do 95%. There's something else that's occurring. And I'll give you a hint. Um, there's something, there's one parameter I could set. One parameter, which would make 98%, even 95% a game changer. Um, in other words, it, it will reach the tipping point of so-called herd immunity, of, of, of where we, through vaccination, have achieved herd immunity, and it won't spread. But there's a fly in the ointment right now, and there's one parameter that would allow us to achieve that herd immunity at 90, even 95% with Omicron. Um, but with that parameter set as it currently is, um, it's, we're still going to get an outbreak. Anyone want to say what that is? There's one parameter that's driving those big outbreaks, despite the very high rate. What is that? I'll check the chat. Waning of infection. Yes, it's waning of immunity. Waning of immunity. Excellent. Sage and Kenneth hit it, hit the ball in the head. So, so let's go take a look at Omicron. Here we go. Boom. Waning, vaccinate 95% with Omicron. I'm going to paste it in. And I'm going to say no waning. No, well, I, if by my naming conventions here, I always put no waning before the name. Naming imp is important. Naming reveals intentions, ladies and gentlemen. It's worth spending a little bit of time thinking about a name. What's the time in my life when I wore a younger man's shoes? And uh, I could... Um, this was long before sophisticated IDE editors were available for code, and I could know how I'd name something with about 80% probability for anything. That would allow me to search for things really quick because I know exactly the name I used, even if it was months ago. I'd, I know from that sort of thing, I'd use this name exactly, and I could, I could go find it quick. That's useful. Names show intentions. Um, consider choosing your names very carefully because they communicate, they make it easier to debug code, to write code, for others to look at it, to have it peer reviewed, to have it tested, et cetera. Okay, um, with that side point being said, I'm going to go, this is no waning, so we need to set it to not wane. And um, the rate of waning immunity per day, I'm going to change to zero times this. No, I'm just gonna change it to zero because I'm not gonna change it back. Um, so I'll change it to zero. There it is. Uh, so we have no waning 
95% vaccination with no waning. And here we go. And there we are. Control of infection. Number of hospitalizations is not material. Number of infections cumulatively. Essentially, we've quashed Omicron with 95% um, with no waning of immunity. Um, hint, um, you could do that for 80%. You won't quash it with 80% with no waning of immunity. Um, uh, we could we could do that. It's so quick. Uh, right click copy, um, right click paste. There we go. And we'll say no waning and no waning. There we go. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the, the principles you're learning here, you're hopefully you're learning to, to think through, you know, how the why we're seeing these dynamics. And you see waning of immunity is really important because it boosts the fraction that are that are susceptible there, right? Um, um, you could see with even with no waning, with no waning going on, waning of immunity being zero, you still get an outbreak at 80%. Um, um, and that's not the case. Even with waning, um, uh, that's, uh, um, that is uh, uh, a minimal um, uh, issue for all intents and purposes uh, within the time frame examined for, for wild type. Waning really makes a difference. Um, this is what I wish, I wish a lot of my health science colleagues under, understood this, why it makes such a difference. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen, the mean time for Omicron to wane, or the mean time for COVID that, um, protection to wane within people is estimated to be between one and three years. Um, I know lead researchers on that uh, here at Canada and it differs a bit by different age groups and so on, but basically it's about one to three years. Um, and you can see why, you know, just saying, well, two doses is enough for you permanently. I mean, that's just cruising for a bruising. I mean, we're going to be smacked, you know, the next time there's a, a big variant coming through, if people stick with that. And even if they get the booster, they're going to need to start thinking about regular vaccinations. Um, uh, to avoid this waning of immunity phenomenon. It makes a big difference. And it may be year to year, you get a booster once a year, but you start to see why. We get people who come in here through their booster, they stay here for a while, they leave, and then we boost them again and they stay here. Or some that are getting the booster are the folks here and they just remain there, but they have a new lease in life. Um, waning makes a really big, really big difference in things, and we saw it in the fall. Um, what we saw in the fall, um, even in the fall outbreak, but particularly in the December outbreak at uh, parties, a lot of that was coming from waning of immunity. And we told the ministry this, and we and the SHA, and of course the SHA planned around it because the ministry wasn't wasn't taking action, and um, it it let us anticipate it well ahead of time and get get ready for that crush and Omicron subsequent rise which we're still living through and people are being driven all across the province and ambulances whereby their infection status is lost. And a lot of the infection status is not being entered in time because the hospitals are overwhelmed and I could go on. But anyway, um, uh, the point is waning of immunity makes a, a big difference representing in models is A1 important. It makes a huge impact on the dynamics of infection within the population. Um, so you might, Anticipate, Larissa raised her hand and I'm glad to address Larissa's question. Yes, Larissa, uh-huh. I'm curious, uh, for our model, the baseline for wild type is, uh, for mean contacts per day is 10, and then for Omicron, it's 15. And yeah. I was curious as to why they are well, different. So, so the truth is, I didn't put a huge amount of deliberation into that versus that. The key operative thing actually here is beta C, it's beta times C. So in other words, it's that times the probability of transmission. Um, and um, however, I did want to reflect the fact that Omicron spreads a lot easier. Honestly, the factor of difference between them in terms of your effective contacts per day, it's probably more than a factor of two. Um, and it's probably a factor of several times, maybe three or four because of the huge uh, aerosol spread 
capacity of Omicron. Omicron can spread with enormous ease. Um, it is spreading within apartment buildings, within the city via ventilation systems. It can spread between hotel rooms um, that um, you know, have, have their doors only transiently open to retrieve meals in quarantine hotels. You know, two people have had their meals dropped off at opposite sides um, in a room located vaguely nearby. They, they each open the doors at roughly the same time. And aerosols go from one room to the other and infects people in the other room. And they know these things. They can trace them down with, um, with the DNA of the actual bug that's infected each person and say, oh, that's from that person across the hall. Um, we know how amazingly it spreads. And there's all these reports of you know, super easy spread. So Omicron, in terms of your effective contacts per day, the number of people that come within your orbit around you who you could realistically infect per day, it's a lot higher for Omicron. And I've reflected as 15 to 10, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hang your hat on it. It's, it's um, probably actually a ratio more than that. Um, and, uh, but I did want to make, make sure it was, uh, it was higher. Um, Omicron spreads scarily easily. It is true. Um, uh, yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Any other question about, about this? Um, oh man. Oh, um, yes. Um, it is in spreading in, I'm just so sorry to hear that, um, uh, about subsequent infections. It, it spreads within buildings. Separate infections, a lot of the problem is they may seem separate, but sometimes you get a, a test result that's negative once or twice, um, not because, because these rapid antigen tests are not very sensitive. They are very specific. So if you get a positive, it means, yeah, you're infected. If you get a negative, um, it may it may just be that it, it didn't pick it up and, and it's not very sensitive. It's not nearly as sensitive as PCR tests, the, the ones that they run in the professional lab. But of course the government doesn't want many of those being done in Mark um, uh, for reasons that are probably in the political domain. Um, and, and so they've really restricted uh, our ability to make decisions based on informed data uh, and science because it might show their decisions are. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, anyway. Um, so um, so those negative tests can show negative and it's as if you've gotten over it, but probably it's, it's staying resonant. So a lot of the times it seems like two infections and in very close proximity, chances are it's one that's resurged or just didn't disappear. It was just an effort. It was just a negative test result. The symptoms may have abated, but you know, the truth is, and, and this is a truth, ladies and gentlemen, your generation is going to need to address. These modeling tools are very powerful. Um, um, we need them to address some of these linkages that are, are, we know through evidence that they're there, but they haven't traditionally been in the sphere of a model like this. One of the big ones that can lead to an infection taking off or not are things like nutrition, stress, uh, stress levels, uh, being really tired, not getting good nights of sleep. These affect your immune system in very material ways, it turns out. And that can lead to your body, you know, having previously controlled symptoms, but now they break out again and it can stick around for that. Um, it's one of the reasons you really want to rest a ton when you're sick, um, pull out all the holds and, and um, put an emphasis on resting, good food and so on. This is not merely grandma's advice. This is based on the science of immunology um, that uh, these things are tangled together. Um, and uh, it's one of the reasons why, you know, infection spread is not a totally different issue than making sure people in the North have really good access to, to healthy foods and so on. They're, they're not independent. Um, uh, you know, the health of each of us is tied up with the health of all of us. So that's true within Canada. It's tried, it's true globally, and it's not merely an empty platitude. There's, there's real science behind it. Okay, that's all we have time for um, for the um, model here. I'm I'm just going to say a few words about the theory here, um, and you'll you'll see why we saw those thresholds. 
So ladies and gentlemen, there are thresholds. So the more vaccination we do, the fewer susceptible people we do we have, and that lowers the ability for the virus to spread. Um, uh, as we have more uh, larger fraction vaccinated, we get less and less ability for it to spread. But then we um, we reach a point where uh, it can no longer spread effectively uh, at all from the start, even with all you know the initial susceptibles, and it and it can die out immediately. We achieve herd immunity. Um, so so this um, key driver is the fraction of susceptibles. Um, okay, um, impact of vaccination here is profound. Um, and, uh, and it fundamentally works by shifting people from the, from the susceptible compartment to a protected compartment um, in a way that shields them. Now, you might argue that this is overly optimistic, and it is. Um, people are not totally vaccinated. There's two ways to represent that. You say, people here are the people who are vaccinated and protected. And you say only 90% 90, 90 of those who get vaccinated are protected. Um, the rest have vaccine failure. It's not 90%, it's like 98% or something. And only have those people transition here. Alternatively, you could have people here have a lower chance of getting infected per unit time and have a flow from these to exposed, reflecting breakthrough infections. And for Omicron, that would be really important because two vaccines are not enough. And if we want to represent those who had first dose only or second, uh, only first two doses or, or booster, we'd probably have a chain of these. Vaccinated with first dose, vaccinated with second dose, vaccinated with third dose are protected effectively by first dose, protected effectively by second, protected effectively by third, as you got vaccinated, it would go up. And as you lost immunity, it would go down. Um, um, but vaccination um, uh, ends up you know, really affecting the dynamics in a, in a profound way, in a way that reaches tipping points, um, this herd immunity. And there's a certain point at which herd immunity is reached that reflects the fraction susceptible. That is the key driver for the dynamics we saw. Um, it's the fraction that are susceptible. It's through that that vaccination works. It's reducing the fraction that are susceptible. And there's a key, a key um, uh, variable that, or a key factor that, um, uh, that, that means the infection can't spread at all key threshold, whereby if you get vaccinated enough people to that point, it's not going to be able to spread. And it's because the fraction of people who remain susceptible is low enough. So let me ask this. We had gone through this in a previous model, um, and we went through it theoretically on some slides. But I I'm going to ask you a set of questions, Socrates-like. Um, not that I can compare to Socrates, but I can uh, apply his method. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, susceptible, um, exposed, infected, recovered. If we, if we were just considered those, um, what is a formula for the, uh, fraction of, uh, the number of people that a infective will infect before they recover for this model? Can anyone say, um, you can put aside the hospitalized, uh, for now. But does anyone remember um, the number of people that a susceptible that someone will infect, an infectious will infect before they fully recover in a totally susceptible population is given by what formula? Anyone? Probability of transmission per uh, discordant Gordon contact. contact. Yeah. Times. Means per mean contacts per person per day times, and then it's over the entire course of their infection. So if you multiply these two, it's the number of people they can infect per, per unit time, say per day. Um, that's what this would be. If they're surrounded by susceptibles, they, man, they, they have this many susceptibles per day, and each of them, they have this chance of infecting, so they're going to infect that many this times this per day. But they're in, the, the question is, what's the number they're going to affect before their entire, their, they recover but over the entire course of their illness? So it's this times this times the uh, number. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, you say C beta mu 
Yeah, uh, that this uh, is become R zero. Uh, That's right. Productive number. That's right. So it's this times this times the mean time infectious. This is the number of people they infect per day. This times this, and then we multiply the number of days that they have. That's right. Now, okay. So what fraction of the population do we need to be susceptible for them to only infect one person per day? If remember, if half the population is susceptible. They in fact, this times this times this divided by two um, per day because half the people around them they can't infect, so they, they're only infecting half the number they normally would. This divided by this times this times this divided by two. If one tenth of the people around them are infected, they they're only going to infect this times this times this divided by ten per day. Um, so. What fraction of the population do we need susceptible in order for them to only infect, for, for the infection to no longer take off, for, for to no more than replace themselves with, uh, with a person before they recover? We need them to infect how many people before they recover? For it to not take off, for it to not increase. One or zero. One or, yeah. Yeah, if they replace themselves with one person, it won't grow, right? They'll replace themselves, but it, it, it won't grow into an outbreak. So it's, we, we need, the, we, we need um, uh, them to only infect one person or, or no more before they recover. What fraction of the population would allow them to infect, to them to infect one person and no more per unit time? If only half the population is susceptible, they in fact the basic reproductive number divided by two um, people before they recover. If one tenth of it is, is susceptible, they in fact the basic reproductive number divided by 10. So we need it to be the basic reproductive. So for them to infect one person, we need it to be basic reproductive number divided by what will equal one? The The basic reproductive number. Basic reproductive number. The fraction of the population that remains susceptible should be no bigger than the than 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 one over the basic reproductive number. That will guarantee that a infected person will infect no more than one person. It actually won't guarantee, but it will make it likely on average they'll infect no more than one person because they normally would infect basic reproductive number of people. Say, you know. 10 and but if the population of people is only one tenth susceptible they'll only infect one person because be the basic reproductive number divided by basic reproductive number is the number of people they infect um so that's the idea here that's the idea so we need no more than one over the basic reproductive number to remain to remain susceptible so we need what fraction vaccinated what fraction do we need vaccinated from the start if we don't have an outbreak on an outbreak to, to take off? We need, if we want only this to be one over the basic reproductive number, um, what, what fraction do we want this to be? And assume no one else has gotten infected and so on. If this is one over the basic reproductive number, this is everyone else. So it's what? One, one minus this one over the basic. This fraction remains as we want it to be no bigger than one over the basic reproductive number. So we need the number of vaccinated to be no more than one over one minus. That's just the rest of the people. It's one minus a fraction that were there. That that's the fraction that should remain vaccinated. So, ladies and gentlemen, over the past two years during the pandemic, you will have heard people talk about vaccination. What? fraction do we need vaccinated? Well, if you're dealing with a basic reproductive number of three, like we were with roughly with original wild type, you need what fraction of the, popula of the population to remain susceptible for them uh, to, to, uh, to infect no more than one infection, uh, to, uh, to, for them to infect no more than one person before they recover. No more than what fraction of the population should be susceptible? 
Uh, two thirds. Yeah, so it's two thirds should be vaccinated. No more than one third should be susceptible. If it's more than one third, they're going to infect basic reproductive number of times that fraction, um, and it'll be bigger than one. Right? If it's one third only, basic reproductive number of times one third, um, basic reproductive number is three, then one one third of it will be one. They'll just replace themselves. Great. So we need two thirds vaccinated. If the basic reproductive number is 10, what fraction do we need vaccinated? Well, 90%. susceptible. Yeah, 90%. The susceptible fraction should be no more than one over the basic reproductive number, which is one tenth. So, and so we need this to be one minus one over the basic reproductive number, which is 90%. If the basic reproductive number like it is for, for Omicron approaches 20, I said 15 in our model, but if it approaches 20 for the ease of doing it in your head, what fraction of the population, we can have no more than one over 20th of the population susceptible. So the vaccinated needs to be the rest, which is what percent of the population? So this would be 5%, one over 20th of the population at most can remain susceptible. We can afford no more than that to remain susceptible. So we need, if it's 5%, this needs to be 5% or less, this needs to be what percent or more? 95% or more? 95% or more need to be vaccinated. Yeah, we're not close to that. And that's ignoring waning. Right, um, so you could see why Omicron was a game changer, ladies and gentlemen, where the basic reproductive number 15 or more, 15 to 20, we need a lot more people vaccinated to prevent an outbreak. That's really what it is. Um, now, people can get um, infected and that will kind of protect them for a little bit, but that's, but you know, waning occurs for both these folks and these folks and folks who get I told you I assumed um, for simplicity a, a common weight of waning, but actually people wane from natural infection faster. The vaccines are really good at targeting certain things. And, and so, you know, if we have a lot fewer than, than, than like 95% vaccinated, we're gonna be dealing with these outbreaks. Um, and we may wish COVID is done, and we all do so earnestly but it'll come back, um, it'll, it'll bounce back because of waning. And that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, places you at a deeper level of understanding of, of the fundamental quandary with COVID-19 and particularly in the, Omicron, the age of Omicron than 98% of the Canadian population. And I might add more than probably 90% of, of um, those working in, in healthcare. So if you understand that, um, um, you'll, you'll understand. Now, uh, I have slides for this that I'll share with you, uh, but the, um, the fundamental outline of it, I tried to emphasize by reference to the model. If you go through, it's the fraction of susceptibles. You know, if you have a susceptible fraction, if the, the fraction that are susceptible is F, the number of people an infective will infect before they recover is F times the basic reproductive number um, here. And we need that to be no bigger than one. And uh, so we need it to be less than or equal to one. And as a result, we need to have the, um, the F, the, the, the uh, excuse me, we need vaccination to be the rest of uh, the rest of people. So. The assumption is, um, you know, the rest of people are protected. And so you get this. This is the critical vaccination fraction. That's the fraction we need vaccinated in order to protect the population. It should be greater than or equal to one minus one over the basic reproductive number. And that's the number that, you know, Teresa Tam would talk about or people on, on national news. That's where that's coming from. Um, and uh, we'll see with agent-based modeling, it's not quite so neat. And with waning of vaccination, it's definitely not so neat. But if you know that formula, you'll be in good shape for the final exam, okay? Um, okay, um, that's all we have time for today. Um, 
lots of good answers here. Yeah, uh, in the population. Um, uh, um, and uh, I'm glad to discuss any of these issues more. But again, with this understanding, you are well equipped to understand the quandary that we face right now in a province whose vaccination rate um, uh, is probably not going to top 80% and where every day the clock ticks for waning the vaccination and with a premier who's not going out of his way to encourage it and, and boosters. Um, yeah, it's a challenge. Okay. Um, I will take a brief break. Uh, what's the basic reproductive number for Omicron? It's estimated between 15 and 20. Um, uh, 17, 18 is a, is a range um, uh, roughly that I've heard. It'll differ by populations because of, because of mixing. But if you're in a situation where you again say, oh, it doesn't really matter if there's vaccine passports and people can come in and mix together, um, you know, C is gonna rise. Um, if you encourage people to no longer maintain masks in schools and the, and the central provincial government says school districts are not allowed to maintain mask mandates beyond a, a certain point, um, the contact rate will rise um, and, and beta will rise with it. Um, and there we, we are bringing on, um, you know, the, the, the risk of a, of a resurgence um, coming about inevitably down the road. Um, uh, I happen to think it'll be a bit later, but um, it's gonna, you know, it'll, outbreaks will, will come and this will, uh, this will uh, quicken them. Okay, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much. We're gonna be talking about agent-based modeling next time. Oh, final announcement. I will post to the link. If anyone wants to get started with agent-based modeling, get a leg up, I will be teaching a tutorial on infectious disease agent-based modeling tonight at um, uh, Mumble O'Clock. It'll be at, um, at uh, 5.15, um, so not uh, an hour and 15 minutes dense, or hence, um, which will um, introduce people in about two hours to some of the the basics of agent-based modeling. Um, I am going to do a brief introduction to kind of uh, why, like um, the, the, the understanding of agent-based models, but we're going to dive into building some models. That'll be a first of a two-part tutorial I'm doing for a different class as an extra tutorial for students interested in it. So I will post uh, the Zoom invite. If anyone wants to get there, wants a leg up beyond my couple thousand videos on the subject online on agent-based modeling um, that you'll find in my YouTube channel, uh, I'll be teaching that course tonight, and I'm glad to answer questions. Okay, I'll be back after a brief uh, break. Um, no, Omicron is much more than 5.15 basic reproductive number. I mean, um, the, you know, Delta was somewhere uh, between six and nine and uh, Omicron is, is far. Although I, I will say um, uh, there, there's some uncertainty about when you count basic reproductive number because it can break through so much more, which speeds it spread to. So, um, yeah, um, okay. Um, yeah, I'll record the tutorial, that's my plan. Okay, thank you everyone, take care there.